Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Dogman Sasquatch Oklahoma Encounters. My name is Lance Hightower, I'll be your host. The brothers Bill and Lane are out at the moment, but later you'll find in the previously recorded episode, Lane will be with me during that interview. Right now, we would like to thank some of you for subbing to the show, because without you, without the listenership, we would not have a show, and we recognize that. So, if I get your name incorrect, I apologize ahead of time, but we want to thank Joanne Oysier, Jeff Gogo, A.M. Benavides, M.A. Cossie, Dante Dante, DB800187, Pierre McKinney, Cody Worcester, and Joe Trueblood. Thank you guys so much. We have not forgot the rest of you. We will be recognizing more folks as we have more shows here. That's one of our promises. We want to recognize you guys as we go along. And we have some really nice creative things we're going to be doing for you guys just for commenting and for subbing to the show later on but I don't want to spill the beans just yet. So, tonight's episode I think you'll find very, very interesting and hair-raising to say the least. It's one of the most interesting and bizarre dog-man encounters that I've ever heard on any show. Uh, This gentleman, you may recognize him. He has been on other shows uh, very similar to ours, such as um, Bigfoot Outlaws, Dogman Encounters, Brenton Song Show, which are great shows. And he goes by Wiley Dave, or his name is Dave Fritz. Now, Dave is out of Tulsa, so uh, he's a local Tulsan. And uh, it's just natural. We become good friends. He called into our show one evening and said who he was. And we said, yeah, yeah, we know who you are. That's great. He said he liked our show, and he'd like to share his story. And so some of you may have heard a story before. Some of you, if you're listening to our show for the first time, and this is the first time you've listened to any shows like this, this will be your first time of hearing his encounter. So Dave's encounter uh, starts out in western Oklahoma. He will give a brief bio of himself in this um, interview that you're getting ready to hear. But Dave is an outstanding woodsman. He he won't brag a lot, but the guy is extremely talented. He makes his own game calls. He's professional. He's a world-class game caller. The guy knows his stuff. He knows the outdoors. He knows animals. It's just amazing what he can do with a game call. And so um, the great thing is we've become good friends, uh, the brothers and Dave. And so for you, the listener, the subber, We've got great shows planned with Dave. We're going to work cooperatively in some co-investigations across the state, and we're going to go out, and the great thing is we're going to improve our equipment to the point where you're going to be out with us. Whatever we see and hear, you're going to see and hear too. So that's the great thing. I don't want to give it all away, but I can promise you, stay tuned. You will not be disappointed at all. We want to bring you a great show and do some different things that's never been done before. So hang in there. So um, well, let's get right to the interview. It's a little rough around the edges because we've improved our mic quality and we did not have the mic that I have right now. I'm speaking to you. This was out of the studio office. This was at my house. This was on a large Bluetooth speaker, so I apologize ahead of time, but um, the content of the uh, interview, I think you'll definitely want to hear and uh, turn up a little bit on your phone or iPad there. So um, let's get right to it. We'll go to the interview, and uh, we'll hear what Dave, what scared him so bad that kind of changed his outlook, and some uh, time back when he was hunting in western Oklahoma, calling for coyotes. Well, uh, let's see. I was, uh, basically, I've lived in Oklahoma all my life, and I've been hunting since I was a kid, about 13 years old, and uh, I'm, a wel- I'm a welder by trade. I mean, I've worked in every aspect of the welding field, uh, aviation, piping, pipeline, power plant, refinery, I've done it all. And I uh, had my own, you know, government contracting business for quite a while, and I was on a lot of bases and, uh, you know, military bases doing things for them. But I've done a little bit of top secret work on different projects and stuff at time to time. And I just kind of, that led me all over the country. So <laughs> being a coyote caller, uh, I got into that when I was 13 years old. My dad got me into it. And uh, that thing just snowballed. That's where I called my first coyote. So I got really good and was able to, Call for a couple of these uh, call companies and stuff, got on their calling staff, and uh, my dad said, well, why don't you just 
you know, make your own stuff. So you're getting their stuff and just you're kind of modifying it and tweaking it and customizing it yourself to make it like you want it. Just make your own call. So I did and it just went nuts, you know. It took off and we did, was real successful with it. So I did a little bit of work for National Geographic. Uh, they did that tall grass prairie show here in Oklahoma and I called some coyotes and stuff for them there. And uh, I've had some, uh, quite a few, you know, partners from time to time, uh, different guys that were in different fields. I've had, uh, was a professional football player. He was uh, my partner for quite a while. And uh, he he played for the New York Jets. We just lost him here recently, Dennis Bird. That was kind of a shock when we lost him. But Dennis was a great caller and a great shooter. And he was, he was really a super hunter. And, you know, I wish I could have had him along when I seen this thing because he's a really good Christian guy and believes in the Bible and stuff. And he, he got me really, you know, started. I mean, I, I was raised in a Christian house, but I was, you know how you are when you're younger and you're so busy doing things, you, you right. know, just kind of drift away from it. But Dennis, he kept me on, he kept me on the straight and narrow. So <laughs> me and him got along good and we talked about a lot of stuff, but never about anything like this. I mean, we never saw anything like this. You know, we hunted. We hunted Arizona, New Mexico. I mean, we hunted all over. And I mean, they're all over Oklahoma. And uh, we would go out at night when I was had my call business running full blast. And I did a lot of magazine work. Then I was taking photography, you know, pictures and calling stuff up to the truck really close range to the spotlight. And Dennis and I would take pictures of them. And then we'd publish them in these hunting magazines. And... Uh, We'd go out at night with a spotlight. A lot of times we'd have a gun with us or nothing, and we'd just be out there on the prairie in the woods, you know, calling these animals in. And we never thought one time about anything like this. Wow. Bigfoot never entered into the equation. We never thought about it. Never get never the subject never came up as long as as I knew him. And uh, so it was just one of them, you know, one of them deals. I mean, we'd out there. We would we call bobcats, mountain lions. Uh, coyotes, we, I mean, badgers, we call badgers up at night and bobcats right to the truck. And there were places that people wouldn't even think they lived, you know, and it was just, the, we got immaculate photographs. But, uh, I got into this hunting deal and, uh, it just really worked out for me. So I shot for a few rifle companies and I was sponsored by Remington and Leopold. I had some really good sponsors, you know, these, these rifle companies hooked up with me because I could shoot a rifle pretty good. The guys that taught me were, were professionals, you know, so uh, I got into that. So I do everything I do, I try to get into it and be, be really good at it. So I was good at it and got sponsored. Well, I, you know, I kind of, the welding kind of took me away from calling for a little bit. I couldn't do it as much as I wanted to because I had to get that business and be successful because I had people working for me. But, uh, you know, I, we'd go out at night and Dennis and I would call, but then I got back into it pretty big. And so I was, you know, still making my own stuff and, uh, a lot of times I would hunt by myself, and I did that because you guys being hunters yourself, you know, if you have a lot of people around, you're not going to see anything. Right. You know, you, I mean, you got if you got an entourage with you, your chances of seeing what you're after are pretty nil. So, you know, a lot of times I'd go by myself, and when I was married, my wife would just, you know, she'd just flip out. She'd worry to death, because she said, well, what if something happens to you? Nobody knows where you are. You know, right? And I said, "Well, you find you find my truck. You know, if you find my truck, I'm around there somewhere." <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, she still still wasn't getting enough answer for her, you know. And my mom used to even get on to me, but you know, I mean, I just did that. I was really confident about what I did. I thought, well, as long as I got a rifle and a 45, you know, automatic, I'm not worried about nothing. And uh, just just never gave it no thought, you know. And I had it all over. Mm -hmm. But uh, this. This deal here, this was, uh, this up here, I mean, I had to really do some thinking. I didn't, when it happened, I didn't even tell my dad about it for, you know, probably, you know, I guess it was about a month, because I was thinking it over and doing a little bit of research and stuff, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, he just, you know, he, he didn't know what to think of it at first either, but the way it went down was I was, uh, I was you know, uh, working out of place and so it was about deer season I was fixing to have knee surgery because I got hurt on this job and I couldn't get in a tree stand very good so I thought well I'm not even going to bow hunt you know I just started I just called coyotes and I was taking new pictures for my uh, stockpile of uh, photographs for magazines to write articles and everything so I just went you know was hunting coyotes all the time and I really couldn't get nobody to go with me because these 
these people, you know, they, oh, yeah, everybody wants to go until it comes time to do it. <laughs> and when, right. when you got to go out there, you got to drive 200 miles because I hunt way out, you know. And uh, they, they, no, nobody wants to go, you know. I don't know if their wives won't let them stay gone that long or what the deal is, but I, I just go by myself and don't worry about it. So uh, I lit out of here about one in the morning and drove way out west. And you know, that morning I, uh, I just hunted with the camera. I, I, I have a predetermined route on a map that I want to drive and I have stands laid out that I want to call so that's what I do I just get out of the truck and walk down there with my tripod and my camera and I call in Kyle and take pictures of them so uh, you know I, I've hunted a lot of them places you know a hundred times I mean it was routes that Dennis and I had hunted and stands that I, st- I still use the stands now and we call hundreds of coyotes in on them places you know it's just like a I guess it'd be like a, a coyote slot machine. You drop a quarter in and they jump out of the ground, you know? Wow. They're always, it seems like you seem, it seems like there, there's always one around these places. We just, it just looks like it's made for predators, you know? Right. So, so that morning, I, I mean, I hunted all that morning, got a lot of photographs and stuff, and then, uh, you know, I, I kind of, in the afternoon, there's a couple hours there, I just kind of kicked back and, and, uh, I ate a sandwich at the truck and was listening to the radio, kind of waiting for the sun to get over to the right direction to uh, make the evening stand. So, you know, when it got about 2 o'clock, I fired up the truck and it started that way, you know, and I started I started calling and had the sun to my back then. and uh, So I was calling these stands. I called in some bobcats, and, of course, it wasn't first season yet, so you can't shoot them. So I got some, you know, pretty good pictures of them. A few more coyotes, but I figured on this this one road that I hunted, I, this this one area always produced some really big coyotes. So I thought, well, this last couple of stands, instead of taking the taking the camera, I'll take the gun with me. So I had the AR-15, you know, with me. So I parked the truck, and when I got out of the truck, that, that was the first thing I noticed. When I got out of the truck, so I went right because I parked this truck down in the low place. And, uh, you guys have grown down as many pump roads as I have, probably. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know how the grass will grow in the middle of the road, you know, where the where the tires roll there that's all dirt all the time. Yes. So when I got out of the truck, I walked to the front of the truck about, about 10 feet there, and I looked down on the side, and then right on the side of that little mountain where the grass grows, I, I seen this huge track. You know, and I'm an expert tracker. I mean, I've tracked mountain lions for miles, and track bulls, I've tracked about everything there is. And so I looked at that track and I thought, you know, that don't look right. I, this thing's as big as your hand, but it looks like a canine. And I thought, there, there ain't, you know, there ain't no hmm. dog or wolf that big. I said, somebody, this is somebody jacking with me. You know, I said, somebody's trying to play a, a joke here on someone. Mm-hmm. And there's a pump jack there. And I thought maybe one of them pumpers would be trying to trick one of his buddies or something, you know. So, right. Uh, I didn't think much about it, so I, I headed on down to that mesa, and I was walking down that road. Well, I got to where the road just, you know, the, that little mound in the road kind of leveled off, and it was just all dirt. Well, I looked down there, and here's this track again. And I can see them really good now. But the only thing was that the the kicker was, man, from the front toes, you know how when a dog shuts down on his on his butt in the dirt, you'll see his, you know, see his hocks, his heels back there. Yes. Where the you know where the, you'll see the butt paw and then the whole well the length of that was about nine inches or ten inches you know and I'm going man that ain't right wow. you know this thing is huge I mean the track's as big as your hand and I didn't have the camera with me and I thought you know I should have took pictures of that track but I didn't do it and wow. later on when I when I told Vic kind of about this you know uh, I described the track to him on the on the phone and then he sent me a picture of one and. He said it didn't look like that, and I said identical, you know. So he said, well, that was a dog man track that he took a picture of down the big ticket in Texas. Oh, interesting. So, uh, yeah, so these uh, these things are everywhere, I guess, you know. So uh, so I, I just kind of blew it off. I thought, well, you know, somebody's playing the joke. So I got my stuff set up and dropped off the edge of that mesa, and I had my gun set on some shooting sticks, you know, and I was... Uh, took my binoculars and I was looking down this dry wash and that thing went out there for about a mile or so, you know, and it was all one of these little choke canyons, you know, it's just, uh, for people that don't know what it is, 
it's like a it's like imagine a riverbed that don't have any water in it and it's just filled with brush it's just got you know mesquite and there's all kinds of uh tumbleweeds in there and everything you know and that canyon just kind of went it went around to the south and headed off towards the east slow turn you know back that way for about a mile okay so uh the wind, the sun's to my back, there's hardly any wind. I mean, about a three mile an hour wind. And I'm shooting that AR 15, which is a 223. And, uh, because I didn't want to, if I get a big coyote, I didn't want to blow him up because I collect those big ones. I keep the big ones. I've killed the uh, 16 here in Oklahoma that go over 60 pounds. Oh, wow. So, uh, you know, I thought, in, in this area, I'd got a couple of those there in this area. So I thought, well, you know, there could be another one here in Alpha Male. So I just comes in on nailing. So uh, this call I was going to use, it was a new one that I'd made. And I'd, I'd uh, modified this. It was a Bobcat call that I tweaked, but I modified it for another sound. And I bumped the frequency up on it. And I was going to try it and see how it would work on coyotes for a long distance. So I... Pick my binoculars up, you know, and I look. I always look before I start calling to make sure there's not anything standing out there, <laughs> so you don't blast it out, you know. Right, right. So uh, I got the gun leaning on the shooting sticks and sitting down there in the, you know, and I'm all camoed up. I got one of those uh, leafy wear ghillie suits on, so there ain't nothing can see me. I mean, I'm totally concealed, and. Uh, I didn't see anything out there, so I set the binoculars down, you know, got that call out, so I started calling. I called one series, which is about 30 seconds long, maybe 45 seconds, and I didn't see nothing. So I waited a couple of minutes, looked real good, and didn't see no movement out there, you know. So picked the call back up, and so I started to blow another series, and about, about midway through that series, I seen something. I seen a black dog coming, movement down there in that canyon. It was about three-quarters of a mile out. And I thought, you know, what is this? So it's kind of, you know, you know how when something's coming, it'll kind of flash in and out of the trees. You'll see it and then you won't. You'll see it and then you won't. Exactly. You know? well, it's working its way through that brush and mesquite. Well, so I thought, well, it's going to get close. It's going to stop and try to send me a look, and I'll get a better look at it with my scope or my binoculars. So it dropped down in a low spot, and I didn't see it there for, you know, maybe 25 seconds or so. And so then it... It's coming, and it's out there about 800 yards, and I can I can see it pretty good. And I thought, the first thing I thought was, I said, man, it's a dang black bear. I said, what the heck the black bear doing this far east of the Rocky? Hmm. That never happened, you know. I thought, this is a first. Mm -hmm. So I figured if he, you know, I wouldn't shoot him, but if he ran up on me and, and give me give me any trouble, I'd nail him. Mm -hmm. but, so, uh I'm thinking it's a bear, you know. I'm I'm a little bit excited because you know I ain't never called a bear in Oklahoma, so I mean I'm I'm on the gun and this thing's still coming, you know. And he's picking up speed, it's like a freight train. So he's on all fours and he's he's he got the prairie on fire. He puts the afterburner on. And he's coming. So he runs up this little knoll, and when he gets to 400 yards, I still think it's a bear because I can see it's just black. And then all of a sudden. It stands up. Oh, man. <laughs> and when that happened, I thought, you know, that's one of those, you know, what in the hell am I going to let you know? So this thing stands up, and it's bouncing on its back feet. And I'm looking at that, and I'm going, oh, there's no way, man. I thought, there's, there's people that smoke dope would love to see that. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, there's people out there, they got some, they got, they got some good stuff, and they, they, they would love to see this, you know? <laughs> And I'm thinking, there's no way. This is, you know, this is a joke. The first thing I thought was, this ain't no, can't be no guy in no suit. No guy can run that fast, especially on all fours, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it takes a few steps, and it jumps up on this little knoll, a little place that was higher. Well, I've got my shooting sticks, and they're rock solid. And I've got a really good scope on that gun. I've got two or three, but that day I was shooting my Bosch and Lone military, and it's got a... a uh, Mills out radical in it. And people that don't know what that is, most shooters do, but regular people don't know if they don't mess with it. Uh, it's a scope that has a mills out rating. It's a bunch of dots up and down a line space in a certain spot, and snipers use it to range their target. So I, you know, I know how to use that thing real well, so I, on 10 power, and I rang, I set this thing up, and I looked at it one time, and I thought, there's no way. So I look at it again to make sure, 
Same thing. It was almost eight foot tall, right between seven and eight foot. Oh, wow. This thing's got ears sticking up like a dome and pincher. You know? Wow. And I'm, I'm, I'm real, I mean, that is when the, the, I guess, what is it, uh, uh, Kumbo, or, yeah, Kumbo says the chili bones come on. That's what he calls it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, this, I mean, it's one of them sensations where it went, this feeling went up the back, my back and back of my neck, you know, and I, I was shaking. I thought, I was beginning to get worried because I thought, man, if this is really real, I'm in deep trouble here because mm-hmm. I don't have enough guns. I knew that that 223 at 400 yards, there was no way that that sucker would knock that thing down with a 50 gram bullet. You know, mm-hmm. it'd be like shooting a BB gun at a, at a locomotive. Mm-hmm. So uh, he was he was looking for me because he knew right where that sound was coming from. So I turned the scope up on 24 power and I looked right down his throat. Wow. I could see the tongue, I could see the thing, I could see the wrinkles in the nose. And it was, I mean, I was really starting to shake. I was i was wondering if I was going to be able to shoot if it charged me, you know. Right. And I thought, what in the hell is this thing, you know? And I'm just sitting there, you know, your mind just racing. What is it? Well, I'm looking around to see if there's any more of them. Because I thought, you know, if there's more, I'm really in trouble. Well, he, he he's looking for me and he puts his nose in the air to try to win me. Mm. Well, he, he couldn't win me. There was hardly any wind, and I'm sitting way above him on that mesa. So, I'm I'm really beginning to get upset. So I I uh, have a five round magazine in that AR-15 because you know the law in Oklahoma says you can only have five rounds in an automatic rifle. You know, exactly. So I've got that five round magazine in there, but I always carry twenty extra rounds, but I can't have a twenty round mag in my pocket. So I dropped that five-round magazine, and I snapped that 20 in. So it gave me 21 because I already had one chambered. And I thought, man, if this sucker charges me, I'm going to have to wait till he gets to 100 yards and just give him the whole magazine. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, it was so big that I didn't think it would do anything. I mean, I, I just, I was just totally shocked. I couldn't believe it. This thing, it looked, it looked like a Bigfoot with a dog head on it. Wow. The, the body went down small you know, towards like a canine is. Uh, it had a bushy tail, had dog's feet on the, you can see the feet and, in the dirt, the dog's feet, you know, and, and the front hands is what got me. You kind of, well, I don't say they were hands, but they were long finger looking like, like maybe like a raccoon. It wasn't like a dog's paw. Hmm. You know, it looked more like a hand than it did a paw. But this thing had saliva dripping from its mouth, so I knew something was, oh. I knew it was real, I knew it wasn't no joke. Oh, wow. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really, I'm really shaken by now. I mean, I'm, I'm uh, upset. I don't know what I'm going to do. I thought, well, if I don't kill this thing when it comes in, they're going to be finding me in little piles out here later on, you know. Exactly. <laughs> so, so I figure, you know, I figure this is it, you know. I'm, we're going to have to, when something like that, it's one of them deals where you're going to have to do business. If it charges you, you can't jump up and run. I got a bad knee. I ain't going to outrun it. Oh, yeah. And I can't. I'm not going to be able to hit him with a gun after I shoot him. <laughs> right. So, so uh, he, he, all of a sudden, after he tried to win me, he just jumped flat-footed right up on that mesa. It was like a five-foot drop from the edge of the prairie there down to this dry watch where he was standing. I mean, one one little jump, spring, and he's up on top of the prairie. Wow. And when he hit the ground, he took off running back to the west and I couldn't keep the scope on him he, that's how fast it was he cleared a 300 yard distance in just like 6 or 7 seconds wow and when it got there was a 5 strand bob wire fence along that road he jumped over that fence one bounce and he hit the road he bounced there he hit over the other fence out into that oil field and he was gone that was it and you know, I was looking around to see if there's any more, so I, I am I'm physically pretty messed up. And I've found it all my life everywhere. You know, Colorado, New Mexico, uh, Arizona, I've been all out, out towards Area 51. I find it right on the perimeter of that place, Tony Paul Missile Range, at night, and I've never been afraid of nothing. And uh, that scared me. That scared me, so... I gathered up my trappings and <laughs> for the truck, 
And I didn't, you know, I didn't have the 1911. It was in the truck, so I, I would all I had was what I had in the AR. But that's the only time I ever went to the truck, and I walked backwards. Yeah. I mean, I was watching that canyon to see if anything else was coming out of there, and I still wasn't relieved after I got into the truck. Uh, I put my stuff in the truck. You know, I, I, I lit the engine off. I turned the truck around. I never took the. I never unloaded the gun. I, as a matter of fact, I took it off safety. So I, I was trolling back down the road, and I had to go out that way where he crossed the road. Oh. So I figured, man, if this, if he jumps on the truck, if he if he's there in the ditch or something, I'm just going to shoot him right in the face as many times as I can mm -hmm. and nail the gas and hope for the best. Mm -hmm. But I it was it was uh, seven miles to the highway, and I'm not kidding you. I was I was still nervous till I got to the black cop. And it, it was dark. It got dark then, you know, and I, all the way home, driving home, I mean, my mind was just racing and spinning. I thought, you know, what in the hell is that? What was it? You know, I mean, how can you never see anything like that? Never even knew it existed. And uh, I didn't say anything to anybody. You know, I didn't tell my sister about it. I didn't say any anything to my dad. And my dad's had it all over. He, he had a ranch in Montana for 10 or 15 years. And uh, hunted in Oregon, and then he's hunted in Alaska with his buddies up there and stuff. And you know, he's he's one of them kind of people. He ain't afraid of nothing either. He built him a house out in the right out in the middle of the Bob Marshall Wilderness area in Montana. And uh, him and my mom lived up there for quite a while. But I started digging on the internet. I started looking around, trying, you know, and I, I thought, well, if I get on. Something here, and somebody's watching me. They're gonna think I'm a full-fledged whack tard, man. They <laughs> they see me looking for some kind of a werewolf channel. They're really gonna be after me, you know. Right. So, but I got to looking and digging, and so this thing come up. This thing come up with a dog man, you know. And I started reading about it. Well, I didn't know about Vic's channel. I didn't know there was a dog man encounter, but I found this Sasquatch Chronicles. So. uh I listened to a couple of them shows on there, and there was a guy on there talking about a dog man, so I called old Wes and talked to him. And when I talked to him, he, said he couldn't wait to get me on the show. You know, oh, man, we got we to gotta interview you. we got to talk to you. Right, right. So as soon as he talks to me, I mean, uh, he had, uh, it was a real successful show. What he called success, I guess, how many people look at it. So then he tells me, well, you need to call me kind of and talk to him. So it's so it's just snowballs, man. I had everybody in the world call me in. And I was trying to, to figure out what this thing was. So I've been digging on that since 2013. And I've been listening to everybody that has an encounter, uh, just trying to, you know, just trying to get information to see what, see if they see what I saw. Cause I don't know any of these people. And that's what Vic said to me. He said, Hey, he called me up and he said, hey, you see what I'm talking about? You don't know any of these people and all their encounters are just like yours. Y'all described the same exact thing. Exactly. Color variation is a little different, but the characteristics are the same, you know. And uh, so he told me, you know, he said that that encounter you had is one of the. He, he said it was uh, uh, some kind of. He did some kind of a show. It was rated top five in the world or something, you know, that of encounters that many people had listened to it. So uh, I just told what I seen, you know, and I can't even see the thing. I, I just. If you see something, you see it. That's all there is to it. I mean, that's right. People, they're going to be skeptics. They're going to tell you, well, you're whacked and, you know, you're smoking dope. And, man, I take drug tests all the time. I work for the military and the government. I mean, I, <laughs> I've never smoked marijuana. <laughs> but there's people that have said, yeah, you got some good stuff, Dave. Let me have some of it. You know? <laughs> they're seeing, they're seeing that. If you're seeing werewolves and stuff, but. So several people asked me, we'll say, well, draw a picture of it. Is that what, what, what exactly did it look like? I just got tired of answering it. I said, have you seen the movie Van Helsing? Oh, yeah. I said, well, just paint that black. Paint that wolf black, and that's what I see. That's it. It's out there. And I don't know where they come from. I don't know what it is. You know, I, I mean, the best, best I can tell is some kind of, Evil entity that's come back on the planet, I think, that, you know, that, that, uh, that might be, I mean, we might be living in the last days. I don't know. It's just, it says cryptids will come back on the planet and, and things will be like it was during the days of Noah. 
Mm-hmm. You know, you and I talked about that. What do they call it? The Nephilim, you know. The Nephilim, that's right. Yeah, it's... Yeah, uh, it's you know, it's... Well, it's just, I was just going to say, the people that typically are uh, a lot of the people saying that uh, the naysayers or that can't exist or uh, are you sure what you uh, saw, what you saw, and typically those are folks that uh, spend very little time in the outdoors, to be honest. They may be camping once or twice a year, possibly, Um, or uh, it's people that's been out in the woods, possibly for a long time, and just because you haven't seen doesn't mean it's not out there. Uh, by all accounts, and so uh, you've spent thousands of hours out there, and the more often you spend out there, the the, the more potential or potentiality of actually coming across this creature. And uh, so, uh, right, I mean, it's just like uh, uh, Lane that's on with us tonight here. You know, it's his sighting. I'm I'm sure that uh, there's lots of people that uh, have said he hasn't shared a lot, but. Uh, it's the same thing. I mean, people just say, well, you know, you must be smoking dope or drinking some good beer uh, to see something like that. But uh, they're out there. That's the thing we're trying to get across is they're out there. And, uh, you know, one of the questions, uh, out of curiosity, if you don't mind, uh, Dave, here is, could you, I mean, the size of this thing, you said between seven and eight feet, in uh, in that reticle, uh, how wide can you tell, could you tell how wide this was at the shoulders? Oh, yeah, the shoulders had to be at least three to four foot wide because, like, you know, I put the crosshairs right on his nose and, and he was taking up a good part of that radical, you know, there's about two two dots across there on the scope, almost three on each side. So he had about a four foot spread on the shoulders. I mean, it was a monster. So we... Same with the monster of the head. The head would have been as big as an ice chest. Good night. I mean, just, you know, monstrous looking head and, and the real, real built up on top, you know. And, uh, of course, the tail was real bushy. The tail was real, you know, looked like a wolf's tail, but it was, a, you know, a big around. It was probably, you know, four to six inches around. You know, I'm a pipe welder, so I can judge sizes and stuff pretty good, and that was that's what it looked like to me, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, this thing had power that was un, just ungodly. You wouldn't. Just, you know, as fast as it could run. I mean, this is the fastest thing i ever seen. That's kind of... I mean, it was like, wham, bam, thank you, man, and he was out of there. When you saw it running, and you couldn't put it in your scope when it jumped up on that mesa, when you saw it coming in, granted it was coming toward you, but when you saw it running laterally to you, could you tell the stride how it was running? What was it? Uh, was it like a... You know how whippet dogs have their front feet pushing back between their back feet. How how would you describe the the running uh, the style between the the front uh, feet and the back? Well, when it, when it ran off, it was on two feet. It wasn't on four. Oh, really? Yeah, when it left out, it came in on four. But when after after it stood up and it jumped flat footed up on that mesa, it took off on two feet. But every time it looked like to me, every time it but it would hit the ground, it kind of, he kind of sprung off, you know. It was like he bounced a little bit. Oh, wow. And, and of course, running on his, running on the, just the pad only, you know, just bam, bam, bam. Just, every time he hit the ground, he was pretty good stride, but he, he had that spring action where he could bounce every time, you know. Wow. And that's why I said when he hit the fence, when he got to the fence, he just jumped over that fence like it wasn't even there. And I thought, man... That thing could jump on top of this truck, and there wouldn't be nothing I could do about it, you know? Right. And I just couldn't believe the power. I mean, you know something like that, that big, a seven-foot tall with them kind of, that kind of width, it probably had to weigh between five and 600 pounds. That was my next question. So it's a, Good night. Yeah, it's going to be a... That's why I think, they, you know, they all wouldn't have shoot, wouldn't have shoot it. I thought, you know, I need a 300 wind mag or... Or a bigger gun, you know, something. And I really, right at that moment, I would have preferred to have my M1A. I had that M14 with some armor piercing in it, you know, 20 rounds of that. And I guarantee I wouldn't have been afraid of him. I'd have put it on target and that'd have been tell you bar the door. That would have took him down. There ain't nothing can take that. Not at no, not at no hundred yards. It ain't happening. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you can take a car down to the axles with that sucker at a hundred yards. Yeah. Yeah. That's a bad rifle, you know. They- Dave, it's 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 interesting yeah. that uh, you're, you're you're talking about this. Um, 
My, my question, I have a question uh, regarding this uh, dogman-type creature. Do you think uh, it spotted your position uh, when it went uh, bipedal after the calling? Do you think it spotted you, and then after, after uh, you know, after you did the initial calling, and then you obviously saw this creature through your scope on 24 power, obviously you could see the facial features uh, of this creature, and, and after the fact, when it took off, do you think it uh, could initially spotted your position, or uh, you know, freak out? I don't know. I don't, you know, he was aware. He, he. It, well, of course, I've called coyotes all my life, and these coyotes can come. It's amazing. I mean, they can come from a mile away, and they can pinpoint your position within a few feet. And uh, this sucker was looking right at me. I don't think he could see me because I was full, in full camo. And I had the sun in his eyes. And uh, I don't know, you know, that nose being as big as it was, he might have got, he could have winded me. It wasn't but about a three-mile-an-hour wind, but the wind was to my back. It was in his favor. So he might have winded me, but he, it took him a little bit to get it because he was there for maybe a, about a minute and 30 seconds, something like that. I looked him over you know, long enough for me to get real concerned. Mm-hmm. And, uh, sure. You know, it would have been great if I could have got some film with this thing, but it just, I didn't have the camera. Oh, yeah, that would know. have been fantastic. Did you, when you had but, it cranked on... But I tried to keep him in, when he took off, I tried to keep him in the scope. And I shoot running coyotes all the time. Mm-hmm. And there's no way, I couldn't, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't have let him far enough to hit him with that 223. There was no way. He was that fast. So, it, tell me this, uh, Dave. You, you're extremely experienced extremely experienced shooting coyotes from all over the country. You know the fastest coyote you've led before you've shot, and coyotes can reach about how fast at their top speed? Well, every time you fire that gun at them, they got another gear. Right, <laughs> right. They got a, yeah, they got, I mean, they got, they got afterburners. They can turn that sucker on, and I've seen them get so, uh, on flat ground, I've been shooting at them in contests and stuff, and they get so low to the ground, man, it's kind of like that Wiley Coyote deal on the <laughs> cartoon, you know, when he's walking on his back toes and his front toes, he's all stretched out there. He's only about an inch tall, you know, when he's sneaking up on the road runner. Right. But that's how it looks, and, they, and them suckers are running 40 miles an hour, you know. But I build, I mean, when I'm in a contest, I shoot a different gun. I shoot a 6 millimeter improved, which is a... a uh, P.O. Ackley round and it blows that shoulder out and there's more powder and you can push a 70 grain bullet over 4,000 feet a second. Wow. And, uh, you know, so I don't have to lead them very far even out there at four and 500 yards just to maybe a one or two dots and I can trap them in the scope and knock them down. I've hit them a long, hit them running out there a long way. But that's what that gun's built for, you know, so if they run, I can hit them, but if they're out there a long ways, I can nail them too. So it's a, it, the less time it's in the air, the less time it has something to happen to it. Right. But I didn't have that gun. I was hunting with a two two three. You know that the six improved is not a rifle where you're going to save the hides very much. I mean, it don't make a very real big hole, but it tears them up a lot worse than a twenty two does. So, you know that gun's built to put them on the ground because when you're in a contest, they don't pay you for ones that run off. So you, <laughs> right. you got to get you get you got to get bodies on the ground, and you got that's that's how you win the contest. Do but, you think? Uh, you do know, you, it's, do you think then uh, if a coyote can uh, blaze at say forty, maybe even upwards of forty-five miles an hour when it's hitting that high gear, do you think that this uh, dogman creature was hitting in excess of fifty to somewhere between fifty and sixty? You think? Oh, that thing could run like an antelope, man. That sucker was out of there. Like, I mean, it was like somebody shot him out of a rifle, you know. I mean, he hit that prairie. He bounced up there one time, and I mean, he was off. He, he looked like <laughs> he looked like a jackrabbit that somebody had been shooting at with a minigun. I'm telling you, man, he was out of there. He, he was like one, two, three, four, five. He hit over the fence and bang in the road and gone. That was it. Wow. Yeah. And I mean, I, when he when he cleared that when he cleared that second fence and hit that oil field over there and got out there, I gathered up my stuff and I I got the hell out. I mean, I, all I wanted to do was get to the truck, and uh, you know it's really it it's been weird because I've had a few. I mean, I, I wouldn't say bad nightmares. I would. I've had a couple of nightmares about it, 
But I'm looking right into his eyes. I mean, I could see everything. What color I could see was the ears it? moving, the, the wrinkles in the nose. The, I could see him breathing with you know his tongue was panting and everything. I could see it all. What color was his eyes? They're yellow. Like amber color. They're yellow, and, and they're not real big or something like a, like they say Bigfoot's got these giant eyeballs. It, it's not like that. It's like it was like a wolf or a dog. You know, the eyes are proportioned to the head. So they were, they were probably big around as a model, you know. Hmm. And so for that size, a, a, a large model about that size. But they were yellow. They were just a yellow color. When you were looking yeah, at the... Was, uh, Dave was... Go ahead, Lane. Was, was there any vocalization uh, um, uh, with this creature? As far no, as no, I never heard of it. He never made a sound. Out. Never did not didn't howl, didn't bark, didn't make a squeak. It didn't do anything. You know, it just didn't make any what sounds. Time? It just... Excuse me? Hmm. What time of day did this happen? It's right at, right about 20 minutes before dark. You know, when it, right, right before sundown. I mean, the sun was still up, and it's just like, you know, the sun's going down in like 10 minutes. It's going to be... It's going to be when... Uh, the sun's down, but you can, it's still not dark. You can still see, you know, there's still light over the horizon. So, uh, sure. you know, it was dark by the time I got to the highway. It was dark. But that's, I was wanting to get out of there. I knew I wouldn't want to be there, you know, me by myself with no backup, nobody, to, I mean, no, no eyeballs helping me look for what might be coming. I was afraid it would jump in the back of the truck. You know, mm-hmm. it's like you're jumping in the back oh, of the yeah. bed, and I'd be trying to get rid, of, <laughs> trying to get rid of him. You know, <laughs> yeah, your eyes wouldn't oh, be on the right. hell of a show, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, that would have been that, been that would have been a ride there. They'd definitely tell you to ride that at the fair. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, when you had it on 24 power, did you, aside from looking in the face there, Dave, did you look down at the um, the hands again? You said that you described them, they looked like a, like an extended or something like a raccoon hand. Did you see any claws on it? Oh, yeah, you can see the claws. I mean, you see the joints and the fingers and everything. So, 24 power, it's like being right next to him. So I mean, what did the claws look you know, you like? Just, uh, they're just... You know, they just kind of, I mean, they didn't, several people asked me this, they said, oh man, did he go way out there and curl under like a, you know, like real sharp on the end? No, it was just, uh, the claws just kind of come out there, you know, like for the size, for fortune, for the size of that hand, you know, they were about maybe an inch long, extended, and they were, I didn't notice them being real pointed or sharp or anything. Now, one thing about the canines, I did notice them, they were really, he had a, he had a set of choppers. Them, them, uh, them canines were really pronounced, and they were, they could do some damage. I mean, suckers are definitely things. How about the bottom? Upper and lower. I was gonna, I was gonna ask the upper and the lower. You said okay, but how long yeah. do you think they were? Oh, them things had to be an inch and three quarters. Man, they were huge. Whoa. And they could, you know, of course, uh, I tell, I tell people this. You know, you know, people that don't study animals like we would, uh, I mean, I know everything there is to know about them coyotes. I mean, that's why, you know, National Geographic had me come and call for them. And I mean, I've done lots of calls, seminars for the Oakland Wildlife Department and different, different, uh, you know, game calling shows and stuff. I used to go to them all the time when Trapper and Fur Meats and Remington and them would put on them big hunting shows and me and Dennis would do seminars, you know, we get a million million uh, questions about what about this, what about that. Well, I got to where I took skulls with me, you know, coyote skulls, and I'd show people, like, even a, a fox, if you look, I had a pet fox, you know, but if you look at the, a, a wild canine, which is a, a fox or a, a coyote, and then you look at the family dog, their, their, their canine tooth is more pronounced. It's a lot tapered, it's more tapered, and it's sharper at the end. Because these dogs haven't made the domestic change. They're not eating food that we're giving them. They're having to kill their food. So they still have the, they still got the, they still got the equipment to take care of business. Mm-hmm. You know? And if you look, you put that dog next to that coyote skull, you'll, in, uh, the trained eye can tell the difference. Do you and that's what this thing had. It had, it had some, it had some, uh, 
Yeah, that's a super chopper. It could have definitely done some damage on a rack of ribs, I guarantee you. Well, based on, yeah, I was, I was going to say, animals will, um, their, their sight of them, especially their canines, tell you a little bit if they're a, a meat eater or a plant eater. And this one sounds tepic, uh, a superior apex predator, a meat eater. Oh, yeah. This thing, if, if, if it wanted to hurt you, if it wanted to get you, and you didn't have the proper armament, all I can tell you is <laughs> he's probably got great poupon in his back pocket. You might as well just get ready. <laughs> he's gonna, he's gonna, he's gonna pull that sucker out and with a knife and fork and just tell you, okay, just lay down here. Let me see how you taste. That's, you know, that's gonna be it because you can't do anything. Yeah. You know, you need a good, you need a gun that has a lot of rounds, thirty caliber or above, and you need to be able to shoot it. In a stressful situation, you know, I've got. A guy, this guy's like a brother to me. He's a highway patrolman. He's probably the best pistol shot you'll ever see. And Mike always told me when we were training and shooting with handguns, he said 100% shooter goes to a 60% shooter in a millisecond when there's a stressful situation. Hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? And that was a stressful situation. <laughs> so I wasn't shooting with a handgun, but I was shooting with a rifle. So I was in fear for my life. So, and all that stuff was running through my head that Mike has been telling me for years and years, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, that's one of them things, you know, where he, like they teach you, you know, you'll train, you'll do, when you're under fire or in a stressful situation, you'll do what you're, you, and you do in training. You'll, you know, I was ready. I knew I could hit it every time with that gun, but I just didn't know if I could do enough damage to kill it. Wow. And studying the thing, after talking to, there is a couple of guys that say they've killed a couple of these. And uh, one kid in Tennessee supposedly shot one. I heard his encounter, but then he, nobody could find this guy afterwards. And uh, he said, you got to shoot it low down. You can't shoot it high in the chest. You got to shoot it low. You know, like up under the rib cage or preferably low in the back because the back is an unprotected area. Mm. Well, I wonder. But the chest, uh, you know. I the, yeah, I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt there. I was just going to reiterate there. No. But it kind of reminds me of one of the episodes on Vic shows of some gentlemen that are uh, uh, a group of military and uh, uh, active military and former military. That uh, he states that he was shooting nine millimeter uh, Desert Eagle 50 caliber uh, AK. Um, and uh, 7.62, and then it wasn't phasing it at all. And I wonder if yeah. the reason why, and Lane and I have talked about this quite often, is their their breastplate, their skull is almost the equivalent, like some of these wild hogs on that shoulder plate, if it's about an inch and a half to two inch thick. Yeah, that's why you need armor piercing. You know, I mean, I, I broke out this... No. Man, I ain't playing no more. <laughs> I broke out the M1 Durand, and I got I got about 200 rounds, 150 grain AP. And if, if I go out there, I'm taking that. Because I'm telling you what, you need something that will get in there and do some penetration. You need a tungsten tip round that will get in there. That's the only thing that will break that bone. Yeah. You know, you're going to have to get in there and do, do some damage. I mean, you're going to have to put steel on target and... And I know that will shoot through stuff because I've, had, I've talked to military guys in World War II that shot them Germans behind telephone poles over there in France and stuff. They said it just went right through and got them on the other side. And a telephone pole is a pretty nasty customer. Oh, so, yeah. You know, yeah. So I, I, if I got that AP, I don't think I'd be too worried about it as long as I could. Well, you know, unfortunately. I have them in there. Unfortunately, uh, uh, the average person can't go down to Bass Pro and buy AP rounds. Uh, no, you got to know somebody in the military. Of course, like I told you, I'm I'm uh, pretty well connected with exactly. the military guys. Right, right. And uh, I could get about whatever I wanted when I was on one of them bases, you know, and tell them, "Hey, I need this or I need that," and they come up with somebody come up with it and be in the back of my truck. Mm -hmm. and, you know, all, right, exactly. They all got connection, but. And this dude that, you know, this guy, this military guy, I've listened to his encounter, and he's, his family's well-connected. It seems like the whole family's either been in some branch of the military or law enforcement their whole lives, you know. So 
the dude, the dude that was talking, that guy, though, he, you know, he ain't no dummy either because he could talk about the weapons and everything. He's well educated and and versed on tactics and weapons, so you know the guy's real. I mean, uh, and I mean, I, I know y'all been around these people. I have people come up to me and want to go hunting with me, and they can't even work on their own gun. Oh, I know. You know, I know. Uh, they want me to sight the rifle in for them. You know, <laughs> I try to tell them how to do it, and they still can't do it. Yeah, we've... So, uh, Dave, uh, go ahead, Lane. I, I've got a question for you. Could, could you tell the audience this, this, this evening, could you uh, kind of a, uh, give them a brief synopsis, per se, on going back to that mil-spec reticle? Uh, as far as... The mil dot reticle? Dot, the dot, what, what's, yeah, the, what, what's the distance as far as how can you tell the height, uh, per se? Just, just, just a brief synopsis. You would please. Well, there's two ways to do that. You, you, if you can, the snipers, we set it up with what's called a mill radian, and that's it's got so many mills, you know, and they break that mill dot, they break that, that dot down into halves where you can tell what it is. And you study this stuff and where you calculate it in your head where you can figure this stuff on the fly. Mm -hmm. And when you're in sniper school. So, you know, I went to some of them classes with the military guys and learned how to do that. But I come up with a lot better way to do it than what the military does it. So after you you shoot something for so long like that, if you're used to that reticle, you get to look at, at certain items in a in a milled out reticle that set, that like a fence post is so tall, right? Mm -hmm. Or or you look at it like a a gate or something, uh, you know, it's so tall. You can measure. You know, different things like a barn door or whatever, just different items. If you get, you familiarize yourself with those items and stuff like that, like, uh, you know, a fence post, but they set fence posts at certain lengths, you know, like a little over uh, 36 inches. Some of them are set there, but the, the steel ones, they're a lot, lot, lot taller. These orange ones, you see some of them have a white line on them. Okay. Well, if you measure them, they're about just a little over four feet. You know, a four feet and two inches, just about like that. That's about most of where most of them are set. Well, if you know that, you can set that mill dot reticle up, and you can set it up and go up that, and you have that reticle, you can look and tell right where he is. And that's how you can figure out how far a coyote is on that reticle. Hmm. You bracket him between those dots, and wherever he's standing, half a coyote, a full coyote, when he's way out there like that, you know about how far he is. So you turn your scope up on what power you want and send it. Hmm. That's how it works. Now, now the now I shoot another scope, which is a a uh, night force, and it has hash marks in it. And they're set at a little bit different interval. But you also there again, you have to shoot that scope against things where you know how tall they are, how tall a coyote is, how you know how tall a horse is, how tall a cow is, stuff at different yards, just so you know which one to shoot. And after you do it enough, it's automatic. You can throw the gun up there if you know the velocity of the rifle, and you're right on. You can nail stuff. It's amazing how it works, but it works great. And, of course, nowadays they've got laser rangefinders and scopes. You know, the thing's hold still long enough. You just push the button, and right. it tells you what dot to shoot. <laughs> right. You took all the guesswork out of it. Exactly. Exactly. So when... But, you know, the... The FBI, they come up with a deal on the mill dot reticle, too, where to, when they're uh, shooting people, you know, for a, a counter-sniper type deal or a hostage situation where they, the mill dot reticle worked against the person's body on 10 power, you know, and there's so many, and it, you turn it up, the scope up and down, like a 3 to 9 reticle or three, two and a half to 10 or whatever, and it's, uh, you can measure that in like a, a certain, from the center of the, Cross here on the guy's chin to the top of his head, that tells you he's 100 yards or how he's out, you know, he's at 200 or 3 or wherever he's at. And the Russians use this reticle kind of like that. Have you seen their setup? In the Dragon Off yes, I, rifle, I, I, it's, it's, it's on yeah. a curve. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it's got little arrows there, and it tells you 1, 2, 3, 4,000 yards, and, you know, cause, and that's what it's doing. You're pinpointing the spot, and it's when you fit into that bracket against that against that curve, well, that's how far away you are. So that's how it works. I mean, once, and once somebody gets used to shooting that, you shoot that every day or 
practice with it all the time and you range these certain items, like I'm telling you, it gets where you hunt coyotes all the time, you can throw that sucker up there on the fly and you know right where to hold. It works great. Works on deer, works, works especially good on deer. Oh, yeah, I bet it does. I bet well, it does. Yeah. Right. Leopold has a setup like that where you turn the power ring on the back of the scope. When it fits into a certain bracket, that's how far away it is. Yeah, you know? that's what I'm looking at, actually. And, uh, yeah. And now, now this guy I'm telling you about, the pilot pro buddy of mine, he builds scopes. He has contracts with the military and stuff and does work for you and South Fix and a lot of them big fancy scope places. And uh, he builds certain reticles, and there's nobody knows more about that I know than, than him. And you know, he's all the time coming up with these fancy reticles and stuff to to put in there. He's real good on the fly like that because he he knows right where to hold because he he sets them up in that calibrator and knows puts them together, you know. And it right works great. And you can actually build them nowadays. Build them for the gun. I mean, the velocity of the rifle. And I don't have time to click. I don't have time to sit there with that cam on the scope and roll it around there at 400 and try to shoot them out there. You know, I have to shoot them on the fly. So I zero the gun at 200 yards and then I hold over or under how depending on where the coyote is. Hmm. And that's, that's how we do it. Right. Dave, uh, I've got, I've got a question. Um, okay. Um, thank you for, yeah, thank you for explaining that to, to our audience this evening. A uh, question I do have, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, maybe maybe you, you, you have uh, obviously or maybe what are you, already answered this question. Uh, what do you think that, uh, I wonder, just out of curiosity, I wonder what the sex of the creature, you know, uh, I wonder if it was a... Uh, now, what was that again? Or, 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 oh, what the sex the was? Sex of the creature itself. Yeah, I'm just really? curious because... Obviously, to tell you the truth, I don't know. I didn't see. I didn't see nothing dangling. <laughs> so I, I don't know. It might have been. I don't. I couldn't tell you if it was a female or what. I was so whacked out by seeing this thing. I was watching the head because that's where the business end was, and I figured, you know, you what you got to do is you uh, when you're hunting coyotes or mountain lions or anything that bites, you need to pay attention to body language because. Whenever they move or do something, it's going to tell you what the next move is going to be. So you got to you got to sure. anticipate that move for the shot, and you got to be ready. But this thing here, you know, I've never seen one of these, so I wasn't taking my finger off the trigger, and I wasn't looking around for that. I was I was watching his head to see if he was going to charge me. Right, but you saw. Yeah, I'm glad he didn't after I seen him run because he was smoking across that prairie, man. I'm telling you that that when, was unbelievable. When it jumped over that fence. Uh, well, two questions here. When it was running, how did it hold its, did it, you know, when, when a human runs, we have a back and forth motion with our upper body for stability and balance and momentum. How did this run with its upper arms? Did, were they still, did they, would they move similar like a human does when they run? Could you? Well, the front hands were just kind of his, his, uh, the uh, like where the bicep area was, it just kind of straight down against his body. And uh, one, I noticed one paw was kind of out. The left paw was up high a little bit, about extended out, and the other one was just kind of down next to his side. And he had that's the way he, he didn't really extend them out or anything. That one one paw was out there away, or the hand was out there away. But what got me was is how it ran because it bounced on every time it hit the prey, it bounced on one of its paws, and the tail. The tail was uh, sticking out straight. It just stuck out there straight like a two before. And he was just getting, it didn't, he didn't wag around or nothing. He didn't tuck it between his legs. It stuck out straight and he, he went right on, just went right, just bam, he was gone, man. I, I've only seen one other thing move that fast, you know, and it had a motor on it. <laughs> <coughs> right, right. Well, and when you saw the tail, and uh, I'll, I'll uh, let you know why I'm asking. When you saw the tail, you said it was uh, it was really bushy. Would you would you say that the diameter was about pie plate size? I mean, was it uh, kind of that? Bushy? Probably, six, probably six inches. You know, it started out kind of small at the right there where his butt was, and then it, it got big, it flared out, and got big like a coyote in the center, and then tapered out towards the end, huh. back down. You know, kind of a Kind of a pot bottle type shape, you know. Okay, okay. 
Well, there was a, uh, the last episode that I did, there was a young man, um, very close, not too far from here actually, and he saw on two separate occasions this, uh, a, a creature. And uh, he, this kid is probably about uh, six, oh, six, three, six, four, and he said it was about waist high on height when it was on all fours. And he said it was the. Oh, yeah, he's, he's right. He said that this thing cleared probably about 40 yards in two seconds. And it jumped over the right. it jumped over this fence, not like an arch, not like how a deer would get to it and jump over, or a coyote would go through or under. This thing had s such a horizontal uh, leap, and it lost no momentum. It didn't slow down a bit. And he said that the what he saw was the back end, and it had hawks, but that the tail was so bushy. It, it was. It was. It, that's the one thing that stuck out in his head, and it was gray or gray silver. And what's ironic? Oh uh, yeah, about the, I can't say mine was black. Mine was black looking. I mean, this this thing here, the sun, I can't, it didn't shine off of him, but it looked like he was soaking it up. You know, it just didn't. It kind of a dull color on him, but he was shining. His fur was shining in the sun. You know, a little little uh, glint off of the fur. Right. Uh, he was well, well, good looking. Specimen. I mean, the thing just—I'd like to have his hide. Oh my goodness! That uh, I could have knocked him down. I'd love to. I would have skinned his ass down and put him on my wall. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the gun wasn't big enough. I didn't have enough. I didn't have enough firepower to knock him down. So, well, I wonder. You know. You know uh, you know, it gets me, and we kind of alluded to this earlier, and I know Lane and Bill and I have spoken about this, uh, and I, I don't know where my position is on their thoughts here, but if they, if people that are out looking in very remote areas, uh, not only in Oklahoma, but surrounding states, and they'll just go out with a camera, and they'll go out and looking in very thick, remote areas by themselves, uh, with nothing more than a camera, I, I think they're just asking for trouble when they do that. I commend them for going out and wanting to investigate and uh, learn more and uh, kind of kick the brush a little bit. But uh, my concern is that they're going to kick up more than what they bargained for, especially if they kick up something like you saw. If they're doing that, they just need to go on down there to, and to where the little men in the white coats are and just go ahead and check in. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you right now, if, if one of them things comes out of the bushes in their face, they'll find that camera. Somebody will get a free camera. But like I said, they're going to find that person in little piles all over the prairie. Mm -hmm. You know? They'll, they'll probably find the Grey Poupon model out there somewhere. <laughs> and, you know, I mean... Yeah, now, these, these things ain't playing. They 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 can come in if they decide your dinner. They're gonna, they're you know they're gonna do it. I mean they're just gonna they're just gonna pull out the ketchup and the mustard and they're gonna go to town. Right, that's it. Well, it, it and they're an opportunistic. You're on the menu. Exactly. You ain't gonna have time to think about it. Exactly. That's that's what I just. Uh, I shake my head at these folks that they've got to take this seriously. When we go out, you've got to take it seriously. You've got to have a contingency plan. You've got to plan to see something. That way you at least have a well, game plan. I used to go out at night. Like I told you, when I was hunting with Dennis, I used to go out at night and walk around. I'd get off the truck. He'd be holding the spotlight. I'd get off the truck, get over, go over the fence, and get right up next to these animals, you know, coyotes. They can't, if the spotlight's in their eyes, they can't see you. And they keep them lit up where they're blinded. And I'd get right up there within two or three feet of them. Get, I'm show you all these pictures I got. I mean, they're unbelievable. Just raccoons at two feet. You know, bobcats, so close you could touch them. And uh, I would get away from the tree. They didn't even have a gun. But I guarantee you, I ain't going nowhere without a smoker anymore. Uh, if, I, if I go outside of town, if I, get, if I go off 169 and get out there toward the port, man, I got everything loaded. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you. Well, if anything, uh, it's definitely taught. Uh, my brothers and I, we talk about this a lot. We're, uh, we're in the process of uh, building special firearms right now with special loads just f 
just in case. Not that I'm seeking to go out and specifically hunt these right now, but if uh, I uh, if we encounter this, I want at least something on my side. Yeah, you got to have, like I said, it preferably needs to be 30 caliber or above, you know, but it's hard to find anything above, uh, you know, 308 that's automatic. I mean, uh, 338 Lapua, most of those guns are bolt guns. and um, Right, right. You know, your best, your best option is an M1A or, you know, if you could afford it and find one, a BAR would be great, Brownie Automatic Rifle would be great, 30 off 6 you know. Right. Take it to a gunsmith and cut the barrel down to about 18 inches and move the gas port back and shoot some AP in that thing and you'd have a smoker. I sure would. You could cut the woods down with that, baby. But an M1 Durand or an M1A would be great or an AR, you know, an AR-10 in three oh eight, and then shoot an armor piercing in the three oh eight, And, uh, because your, your encounter is not going to be very far. It's going to be 100 yards or less, you know. Right, right. And these things ain't going to... They ain't gonna, if they jump out at you, most of the encounters I've heard they jump out at about 65 or 50 yards, somewhere like that. I mean, you, I'm mean, i not going to tell you that I'm going to go out there and say, okay, tonight we're hunting dog, man. I'm going to try to kill one. But if you're trying to see the thing and figure out and research it and figure out what it really is to get photographs and it decides it wants to eat dinner, you're going to have to do business. Well, uh, that's the thing, is that these things are so fast, so strong, so elusive that uh, when you decide to, uh, you figure out how to call it up, which obviously it was attentive and it was interested in what you were, uh, you were calling the dinner bell. And uh, so well, it came yeah, in. Yeah, that call I've got, I haven't sold that to anybody. I won't sell it to anyone because they'll just get themselves killed using that. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't either. I think that's a smart move. I think it's a smart move. Um, Lane, did you have any further questions on this encounter? Well, you know, going back to what uh, Dave was talking about, you know, his call and uh, not selling it to the public, which I totally understand and respect, I know that there is a typical frequency that they can hear. And also, what's interesting regarding coyotes is the fact that they all, they, they had a language, and they had certain, uh, certain yelps and, and chatters. It's almost like a, a sometimes a, like the hyena type uh, laugh or chatter. And I know it's all communication. Whether it's uh, in, whether it's where it's feeding time, or I'm over here, or it's time to leave, or uh, can you re can you uh, relate to that, Dave? From over the oh yeah, I'll use that certain like this time of the year now. February is mating season, you know, and we use that. I use that uh, that how and you got to know what to say and when to say it. But if you know what to do, you can bring the alpha male right to you. Uh, when it's when it's uh, mating season, females sound totally different than males, and you can tell when they're courting each other and stuff. If the one's got a lost mate, or that's how they communicate. So these, uh, when we use that against them during during the uh, this part of the year, and I've got you know I've got a a uh, it's about a twenty minute video I guess of me calling the coyote up. I called him in. Uh, with a regular mouth call that I made, and he was a great big, he was a big one, he's an alpha male, but I, my wife filmed this thing, my ex-wife did, and uh, this coyote kind of stays up for 20 minutes, and we're barking and howling at each other. And whatever I do on the call, he does the exact same thing back. So, uh, you know, there's been two or three TV shows trying to get it, National Geographic one, and I've still got it on a DVD. I just look around here and find it, but when you show that to people, it blows their mind. But these animals communicate, just like you said, and, you know, it's, they hear at a certain frequency because they, they make their living hearing a rabbit die or hearing certain animals, and when they get attuned to that, they, they hear that, well, that right there tells them that dinner's on the table, they're coming. Mm. And uh, if they're hungry, it doesn't, well, a coyote's always hungry, they're just, all they are is a land shark, you know, they're, they're, uh, they run around out there, all they think, they think about jackrabbit sandwiches 24 hours a day. And they got great food in their back pocket, too. <laughs> but they're, uh, <laughs> but they're, uh, they're all running around out there trying to get dinner, you know, but they, like you said, they, uh, they hear that free, they hear in a certain frequency. Well, I was, I used to tell people this, and, and I had to prove it to them. Cause, you know, you know, these naysayers, you know how people are, they've hunted a little bit, they think they know everything. And 
I take guys with me and I say, well, when you're doing it right, there'll be rabbits come to the stand too. Rabbits will show up at the stand. Oh, bull, man, ain't no rabbit going to come in when you're hunting coyotes so he can get eight. I can show you pictures of them sitting right there in front of us. Jack rabbits, cottontail, they'll be all around us, man, because if you're making the right, the real sound when they die, they come to see what's wrong. Hmm. You know, they come, they come to see what's happening because they think, hey, one of our guys is in trouble. So they run to see what it is. And here, this is another scenario here. Dennis was, uh, after he got hurt playing football, you know, he was, he broke his neck in 92 or 93 there and he was injured. And so I had to take him out and, and help him, you know, look after him and he couldn't walk really good because, you know, he was recovering from that. And, he didn't want to stop hunting. You know, he was my partner. I wasn't going to leave him. Right. So I would help him get to the stand, and, and it was Dennis's turn to shoot. So I laid him down on this little mesa, and I started calling. And this coyote was on a dead run coming coming to us, and a jackrabbit come up. And this jackrabbit was about 15 yards from us sitting right up there next to a mesquite bush. And that coyote come under that fence. He saw that rabbit sitting there. That rabbit never moved. That rabbit locked up. He snapped at that rabbit and come right to the call, and Dennis shot him at 10 feet. Whoa. He gave up that rabbit for the sound of that call. Now, you tell me what happened there. Wow. <laughs> I've never I'd have never that. believed it in 100 years. There's me sitting right there on the hoof, but he's coming to the he's coming to that sound. Hey, we've called them off cow carcasses where they'd be eating meat on a cow carcass. And we hit the, we hit that little call I call a crybaby, and I mean it's like somebody launched them suckers out of a freaking wrist rocket. Here they come on a dead run. I've had them fall down coming to the call. They'd be tripping over each other trying to get there, you know. And it, it's the funniest thing you've ever seen. We'd be laughing so hard sometimes we couldn't even shoot them. You know, we we get to laughing at them. They get so greedy. I mean they're just greedy trying to get to that rabbit, you know. And right. It's just unbelievable the stuff that they do to try to get that meat. You know, they want, they think it's the easy meal. I mean, uh, you know, if it's free, give it to me. That's the way they live. <laughs> right, right. But, uh, but, you know, they turn down, they call them off of a dead cow. They said right there, they got meat right there. And, then, and I think it's, I think it's for the thrill of the kill and the fresh meat. I think that's what it's got to be. Well, I wonder, too, yeah, with this. Each... Yeah, go ahead, Lane. But you're yeah, correct about the frequency. All these animals have a frequency that they live by. And when they hear that frequency, they know somebody's ringing the dinner bell. So all I can figure is that that frequency I used in that call evidently is close to, I don't know what it's close to, uh, uh, a donkey or something like that that might be dying or whatever, and they think, you know, that something that's big they would kill. Because it was a loud call. It was really loud. I wanted it to reach out. And it did. It reached right out there and got him. So I know if I use it again, the same thing's going to happen. Right. Right. Yes. And who's to say it won't call in? And who's to say it won't call in a Bigfoot? I'm just saying what's interesting uh, regarding the uh, Bigfoot hominoid type creatures is, you know, uh, and I've uh, told the audience, uh, you know, a couple times about my encounter. Um, you know, uh, it, it's, 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 as far as what I saw, uh, it, it, there wasn't any vocalization. I did see the creature about from 30 feet away, but what's interesting oh, to me man. through all the years, uh, is the fact that, um, I've wondered what type of food sources that they consume, whether, uh, you know, the, these Bigfoot type creatures as well, what, what, what food sources they consume, obviously in their diet. Well, I know they killed deer, and I was and I was uh, listening to uh, oh uh, Jim King and Tim Baker talk, you know, and they were talking about the, the everybody said, let's see, who was that guy? That was, I can't remember the guy's name that was talking to him, but he said he asked him. He said, "Why do you think we got so many Sasquatch now? All these reportings, you know, since the '60s, and then it's just been an explosion through the last twenty or thirty years." Well, look how many deer we got now. Exactly. And Jim Lansdale, you know, do you know Jim Lansdale? You know who he is? He's on that show, Killing Bigfoot. Yeah, yeah, I've heard, I've heard of him. And uh, Jim, that's what Jim said. He said, we got so many freaking deer. 
He said that you can't, they're like rabbits, you can't mice, you just step, you can't already go outside and just step on one. And these things make their living eating those deer and stuff. So when you got a lot of whatever food source you got, you got a lot of them, you're going to have a lot of ever whatever eats that, you know? That's true. And that's probably why they've made a, a huge comeback that they have. And these naysayers out there that say, oh, I've been hammered by that. I mean, you just wouldn't believe the stuff I've heard and what i got to put up with about Bigfoot and stuff. You know, but, oh, man, that, you're, you need to see a psychiatrist, man. You're whacked. They need to pull your security clearance, man. You're whacked. I said, no, let me tell you what. I said, when the sun goes down, I couldn't pour none of you in that pickup. I said, you guys are great at talking while the daylight, while the, uh, daylight but as soon as the lights go out, I couldn't find you. <laughs> I said, you. Yeah, exactly. You start gonna be, yeah, you start gonna all be gone. But the thing of it is, I've, I've offered to take some people to some guys I know that can show them a Bigfoot, and they've always got some excuse. They've always got an excuse, you know. And they're the ones that say it don't. It's not possible. It don't live. It's not out there. And I used to be the same way when I was younger. I thought, well, that's in the Pacific Northwest. But after I met some guys I met here in Oklahoma, they changed my mind on a whole lot of stuff. So we continue to have conversation with Wiley Dave on some other subject matters, which will probably make part two regarding the Bigfoot Sasquatch phenomena. We started discussing with him different opinions regarding these creatures, and he started sharing more and more stories of friends and family members and friends of friends that have had encounters Dave said that initially when he began to tell his story of this encounter that he had of witnessing and calling in this dog man creature, he said, I can't unsee what I saw. I saw what I saw. And that's that. And I'm telling the truth. Have you noticed Dave? He's a matter of fact kind of guy. And I think that's what's appealing to him and my brothers uh, about him rather is it's that uh, he's matter of fact. There is no gray. It's black or white. And that's what I appreciate about him. And he just said that at first he was ridiculed severely, and uh, in many uh, circles he still is. But Dave, he said, you know, at the very end when people, he invites people to go out, everybody all of a sudden doesn't want to go out after dark, as he mentioned. And so my brothers and I, we're going to go out with Dave this spring. We're looking forward to it. We're really excited to be with him and see what we call up. This is where we're going to actually take you in the field with us. We're going to take some high-def photography and uh, audio with us, and I don't want to edit anything, so what we hear and see, you will hear and see as well. So again, we're going to make part two of us discussing this Sasquatch Bigfoot phenomena later on on, in the next episode with Dave. But in the meantime, we're going to go ahead and close out this episode And if you or anyone you know has experienced anything similar to what Dave's experienced, we'd sure like to hear from you, especially if it walked on two or four legs. It doesn't matter. If it was something unexplainable that you couldn't explain and frightened you, we would like to know. Sometimes it feels better just sharing. We have a new toll-free number, 1-866-306-8085. Again, that's 866-306-8085. If you would, just give us a contact name and a number. You can remain anonymous if you wish. You don't have to be on the show. We will respect your anonymity. We just want to hear what happened. We want to hear your story to better document it, to better inform you, the listener, as to what happened and actually how it happened. So thanks, folks. We appreciate you listening to this episode of Dogman Sasquatch Oklahoma Encounters. We are Cryptid Brothers Investigation of Oklahoma. Take care.